I've already mentioned we're going to go to the book of Romans, and as you likely know, Paul wrote the, uh, this letter uh, to a church in Rome, uh, a church that had been established, but not necessarily by him. He had not actually been to Rome yet. Uh, sometimes I t think we tend to think that this is one of the, the churches he established on his uh, missionary journeys, but actually this church was believed to be begun by those Jews that were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out, uh, who were discipled before they returned home. And when they returned home, and again, Jews would come from every part of the Roman Empire uh, to Jerusalem. It was required by the Lord that, that at the three feasts, all the males among the Jews would have to appear. So they would have been there at Pentecost because that was one of the three feasts. So they returned and they established this church, but now Paul is writing to them to make sure that they understand fully uh, the gospel of God's grace. And so essentially the book of Romans is an explanation of the gospel, and uh, it is a very in-depth explanation of the gospel. Sometimes Paul says some things that are difficult to understand, but I hope that at least the section we're looking at uh, today will not be difficult because Paul's main point here is that we are not justified. We are not made right with God through our works, but through his grace. And he uses Abraham as our example. So let's just read the passage. First of all, I'd like to um, uh, read Romans 4 verses 1 through 8. I'm only going to deal with the parts that have to do with Abraham. That would be verses 1 through 5. So this is what Paul writes to the church at Rome. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works... His wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Uh, may the Lord again bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, uh, I think you understand that this morning we are coming to the main point at issue in the Reformation. The reason why there needed to be either a major change in the church Remember, the, the reformers were seeking reformation, not revolution. But if there was not reformation in this area, there needed to be a major break from that church, which essentially is what, is, was, is what happened. Now, we're going to hear this evening, again, or be reminded that there were many areas where the reformers disagreed with the Roman church. We've actually already looked at several. And let me just mention a couple. Remember, Rome believed that the clergy, those priests, ministers, should be celibate. That is, they should not marry. The reformers disagreed. They not only saw that this was not something required by God's word, but that if the priests didn't marry and they didn't have the gift of singleness, it would lead to immorality, and that's exactly what it did. As a matter of fact, the Roman church was notorious. The priests were notorious. The popes were notorious for their illicit affairs with prostitutes and others. That's something we're also reminded of. Rome believed that God's word should be withheld from the people because they would misunderstand it, they would misinterpret it, where the reformers believed that each individual should have the opportunity to read the Bible, to read God's word in their own language so they could see for themselves what it is that God said, that their faith might rest upon God's word and not what man has to say. As a matter of fact, the Roman church actually uh, locked everybody into dependence upon them because they were the only ones who could read and understand uh, 
the Word of God. So you had to learn about it through them. The Reformers believed that everybody should be able to learn it for themselves. Rome believed in the mediation of Mary and the saints, that we have to come through them if we want to come to the Lord Jesus. We can't come directly to Him. While the Reformers believed that we don't need someone to bring us to Jesus, that the Father actually gave us Jesus to bring us to Him to be our mediator, to reconcile us to God. Rome believed the Pope was the vicar of Christ, the one who takes the place of Christ on earth as the head of his church, while the Reformers believed that Jesus alone is the head of his church, in heaven and on earth. He doesn't need a, a human head. He is the head. Rome believed that popes and councils could not make mistakes, that they were always right, where the reformers saw them as men who not only could make mistakes, whether individual popes or councils, but who in fact did make mistakes. Remember last week we saw that as Luther was going through his debates in, uh, was it Augsburg and Leipzig and, and so forth, uh, he, he made it quite clear as he was arguing with them that popes were not infallible, councils were not infallible, only the Word of God is infallible, and that is where our faith needs to rest. They disagreed over purgatory, the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus in the Mass. The Reformers reject that idea, and of course, they disagreed over many other things, and those disagreements actually still exist. Nothing has really changed in the Roman Church since those days. As a matter of fact, the Council of Trent actually solidified those things, where at that ecumenical council, they declared that what they held was true. And if you believe anything differently than that, that you fall under the curse of God. Okay? And actually, we're going to learn a little bit more about that this evening as well. But again, the most serious issue on which they parted ways that which was at the heart of the Reformation, because it is the very foundation of the church, the truth on which it must either stand or fall, was that justification is by grace through faith alone. Simply put, that we are just or counted righteous in God's eyes, not because of what we have done, but only because of what Jesus has done. And that that work of Jesus is given to us as a free gift. And that it might be free can only be received by faith. Now that's what we're going to look at in a little more depth this morning from this particular passage. And next week we're going to consider a parallel truth that we don't want to separate from this. That saving faith or the kind of faith that actually justifies us is something that transforms the life so that we become more and more like Jesus, so that we actually do good works. Now, I thought it would be helpful, even though I'm sure we understand these things, I thought it would be helpful to begin with a few definitions uh, of the terms that Paul is using here. I think we're better going to know what Paul is saying if we understand the words that he is using. And I think perhaps some of the words that we're using here might be a little bit unfamiliar, especially the word justification. I want to make sure we understand that word. Now, R.C. Sproul has already noted in the Reformation series that the word justification, even though the word itself actually means this, to make righteous, that that is not what is behind the Greek word that is translated justification. If I may use another illustration, you know how in uh, 2 Timothy, how Paul says to Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, and so forth, right? Well, the word inspired there is actually not a good word to translate the Greek word behind it. The word inspired means to breathe in. And yet, the Greek word means God breathed or breathed out by God. As you can see, the word is not the best word. And actually, as I say that, I'm wondering why they even use the word. But it's probably, you know, inspired. But it's probably because they've used it for so long, they don't want to change it. Well, the same thing is true here. The word justification may mean to make justification. 
righteous, but that's not actually what it means. But this is the way that Rome understands it. The word that Jerome used in the Vulgate, and remember the Vulgate is the fourth century translation that Jerome made of the Bible in the original languages into Latin, into the language of his day, so that the people of his day could read it, which is something that the church after his day would not allow, the very thing that Jerome actually did. In that translation, he uses this word justificare, and it does not accurately convey this meaning, as I've said, behind the Greek. Now, the problem is that Rome then interprets this as a process by which God actually makes us to be righteous. In their view, God does it through the priesthood. He does it through the consecration of the sacraments, putting grace in the sacraments, giving us the sacraments, as it were. And through these sacraments, we actually become more and more holy. We become more and more righteous. We're given more and more power to do what God calls us to do until we become good enough. And when we become perfect, God then looks at us and says, you are perfect now, and so you may enter into heaven. Now, again, the problem with this is it confuses justification and sanctification. It, it confuses sanctification, which is making us more like Jesus, making that process to be the basis of our justification. I'll make you like Jesus, and when you're like Jesus, then I will say you're like Jesus. I'll declare to be true what is actually true, and when that's true of you, then you can enter into heaven. Rome believes that God will only declare us to be just when we actually are just, when we actually are perfect. And if we don't reach perfection in this life, then, and again, the vast majority of, of Christians in their view will not, then we will have to become perfect in purgatory. And that may take millions of years. Now, the Greek word, though, does not mean to make righteous. That's not what it means. It, it really means God declares us to be righteous. God declares us to be just. He says we have done everything right and nothing wrong, not because that's what we've actually done, but because this is what Jesus has done in our place. We just read in here that God, he says, but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. See, he doesn't declare just those who are just, but he declares just those who are still ungodly. He says his faith is credited as righteousness. And that's what we're going to look at, of course, this morning. God declares us to be just not because we personally are righteous and just, but because Jesus is and he has given to us his righteousness and his forgiveness. That's really what the gospel is all about. Now, two more words we need to understand, of course, are works and grace. Works, we know what works are. Those are the things we do. Our obedience to God's law. Our acts of righteousness. Our devotion to the Lord. Rome says that's how we actually reach justification. But Paul tells us that that isn't. Those, those cannot, our works cannot make us righteous, and we're going to see why. And, of course, we're familiar with grace, God's unmerited favor, unearned favor, something he freely gives us that we have not deserved, that we do not earn. Now, again, I would remind you that this word is most often used in the Bible to refer to God's giving something good to those who deserve really the opposite. Not giving good to people who are neutral, but rather giving eternal life to those who deserve eternal death. We deserve destruction, but God gives us life. So he gives us something good when we deserve something bad. And then finally, there's the word faith or the word believe. And here we do need to be careful because we need to understand it as the Bible, you know, understands it. It's usually understood today as a conviction, a belief that the gospel is true. 
that Jesus really is the Son of God, that Jesus really did become a man, that he really did live a sinless and perfect life, and he really did make an atoning or atonement, a payment on the cross for sinners. And just believing these things are true is enough to justify you. Well, certainly you do need to believe those things in order to be just, but the word faith here means more than just believing the facts. It means believing those facts and seeing the promise of God that everyone who actually believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, you actually take hold of Jesus and you trust him to do what he promised he would do if you would look to him, if you would trust in him. You believe the promise, you act on the promise, and you receive what was actually promised. You see, if you only believe the facts, you only know the promise exists. You only know that it's true for everybody who will actually trust in Jesus. You actually need to trust him. Well, having, again, looked at these things, let's consider what Paul says in our passage. Now, the first thing that Paul tells us is that justification... That declaration by God that we are righteous completely leaves works out of the picture. It can only be received by grace as a free gift. Now, he uses Abraham as an example of one who was justified, but not by his works. He writes in verses 1 and 2. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? What has he discovered? regarding how to be right with God. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And the reason why it's not before God is because it is not by his works. It's by God's works. Justification cannot depend on our works. Now, why? Can it not depend upon our works? Well, there's at least two reasons why it can't. The first is because of our condition when we come into the world. Remember what we read in Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were living like the people of the world. You were children of wrath. You were under God's wrath. Now, in the book of Romans, Paul says exactly the same thing. He reminds us of this back in chapter 3. And the key words that we need to see here are in verse 12. Listen to what Paul says here. This is reflecting what the Old Testament says. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, that's why we can't be saved by our works, is because there is nobody who actually does good works. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, the reason why we can't do anything good, again, is because of Adam's sin. Because Adam, as our representative, disobeyed God. And his disobedience made him guilty. His disobedience made him sinful. And because he was our representative, his disobedience made us guilty. His disobedience made us sinful. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5.18, at least the first part of it. So then, as through one transgression, and that's talking about Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation to all men. See, everyone is guilty because of that one sin of Adam, and everybody is condemned by that one sin of Adam. And then he writes in verse 19, For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. When when Adam disobeyed God, He became a sinner. He lost his, what we call, original righteousness. He lost the Holy Spirit. And he could no longer obey God, which is why he tried to cover his his nakedness. And he hid from God when God appeared and so forth in the garden. He was a sinner. And through that disobedience, we also were made sinners. So we came into the world guilty. We came into the world as sinners. And that's why we could not do anything good. Now, Paul does not mean by this that we can't do anything outwardly good, that we can't do the things that God commands that actually help other people. When we look at the world around us, we actually see that maybe very often unconverted people who don't even know the Lord Jesus do more good in that sense than those who actually know Jesus. Jesus. 
I mean, there's great, you know, people who are benevolent and people who are rich and they're giving away money to different foundations, different scholarships, trying to help people and so forth. And maybe they're doing it for tax write-off, I don't know, but they're helping people. So they're doing, you know, that kind of good. Paul isn't saying that unconverted people can't do that, but what he's saying is that we can't do anything that's really good. The things that God commands, but with the right motives, not just for a tax write-off, not just so people will look at me and say, what a great uh, benevolent person you are and so forth, but out of love for God, out of love for, for our neighbor, out of a love and a desire to honor the Lord in the things that I do because I know this is what is pleasing to him. You see, that's something the unbeliever can't do because he doesn't love God. Now, that means that if we come into the world with the inability to do any real good, then how could we work our way into basically a state of justification where God says, you are so good, you're perfect. And because you're perfect, I'm going to say you're perfect, okay? Uh, and you can enter into heaven. We would never be able to do that apart from his grace. Paul goes on to tell us, uh, particularly in Galatians, that as long as we are in this, this mode, as it were, of trying to get God to accept us through the, our own efforts, through the works that we do, that we are still under the curse of that broken covenant that Adam broke for us. We call that the covenant of works. We're still under the curse and penalty of death. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now he actually addressed that to the Jews who thought they were making themselves right with God by obeying the law of God. Paul is saying if you're going to try to make yourself right through obedience, you are under still the curse. You're still on your way to hell. And that's the reason why the, the Jewish nation and the leaders of the Jewish nations hated Jesus, handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. That's why they rejected him and called out for his blood because their eyes had not been opened. They were still dead in trespass and sin. They were still trying to make themselves right with God by their obedience. Now, something we're going to look at next week is that Paul is not saying here that we shouldn't obey the law. He's simply telling us here that if you try to make your way to heaven through obeying the law, you won't make it, okay? It's purely by God's grace. But once he saves you, then you obey, not to make yourself right with God, but because you love him and because you want to do it, because he's changed his heart. So, but the point here is, because we come into the world in this kind of a state, there is nothing we can do to work ourselves into a state of justification because we cannot do any good works. Now, the second reason why works does not fit in the equation when it comes to justification is because God says He desires all the glory for our salvation. And it is only right that God actually receive all that glory, all that credit, all that honor because justification really is all His work. Listen again to what Paul writes in verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Basically, Paul is saying if Abraham, through his own efforts, or even with God's help, had become so good that God had to declare that he was righteous, then Abraham could honestly have said, I have something to do with it, and just kind of pat himself on the back. But Paul's point is he cannot say that for the reasons we've already seen. He had no part in his justification. That was purely of God's grace. We have no part in ours. It's purely of his grace. There was a monk and a theologian who lived in the fourth and fifth centuries whose name was Pelagius. And he read the Bible and, and he came to the conclusion that all Adam really did to us when he sinned in the garden was give us a bad example. That was bad Adam, that was a bad example. And so he said to the people whom he taught, don't follow Adam's example. Don't do bad things the way that he did. Instead, follow Jesus' example. He gave you a good example. 
And if you just follow his example and live a perfect life as he lived, you will be justified, you will go to heaven. Basically, Pelagius was saying, you do it all by your own works. But you know what? There was another theologian who lived in his day by the name of Augustine, and you've perhaps heard of him. Uh, Augustine is somebody that we have a very high appreciation for. Not everything that he wrote, but certainly a lot of what he wrote. Augustine rejected Pelagius' view because of what Paul says here and elsewhere in the Bible. Pelagius implies that we not only contribute something to our salvation, but we contribute everything to our salvation. God only gives us a good example, but that's all he gives us, and that absolutely robs God of his glory. You know, any view that leaves room for any contribution on our part towards our justification is wrong because it takes away something of God's honor and gives us a reason to boast, to pat ourselves on the back. Now, Paul says further that to add our works, any works, any contribution on our part to the work that he has done through the Lord Jesus Christ is actually to destroy grace. Remember how we saw works and grace are opposites. It cannot be both. It has to be one or the other. They cannot exist together. Romans 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Works destroys grace. Now, if you understand that, then you can understand why Paul wrote to the Galatians this very thing, that to add anything to the righteousness that God provides in the Lord Jesus Christ as the reason why he should declare you to be just, he should justify you, is not just to fall partly away from the Lord, but it is to fall entirely away from him because it destroys the grace of God. Listen to what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 5, verses 2 through 4. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. And then notice, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Whenever you turn to works, you're turning away from grace, you see. You destroy the grace of God. You have fallen away from Christ as the only grounds of justification. Now, the reason why Paul said this is because the Galatians or the Judaizers who were trying to teach the Galatians this view were saying that Jesus isn't enough. You also need to be circumcised to be saved, to be justified in the sight of God. Paul took Timothy on another occasion and he actually had him circumcised so that when they traveled through the Roman Empire and went into the Jewish cultures and so forth, they wouldn't be offended by the fact that Timothy, whose mother was a Jew, was uncircumcised. Now, there was nothing wrong with doing that, but that's because Timothy was not trusting in his circumcision to save him. He was only using it as a tool to witness to the Jews. So there was nothing wrong with the circumcision itself. I mean, in our culture, many of the male children that are born are actually circumcised. Does that mean we've fallen away from Christ? No, but it's when you add it to the work of Christ, and that's what they were doing here. Now, if that's true of circumcision, what would Paul have to say about what Rome adds to the work of Jesus Christ? Now, that's something we're going to look at this evening, but that's the question we want to ask. Have they added our works to salvation? The answer is yes. And in doing that, they have actually destroyed the gospel. And you're going to hear R.C. say some words about that this evening. We should also note here that if we are justified by grace alone, by the work the Father does, through Jesus alone, this also excludes the idea that we need to work in order to keep Jesus 
our justification. Now tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. This, this was Charles Finney's view, but I want you to notice that there's a lot of churches who actually believe this today. Charles Finney taught that we are saved, that we are justified by believing in the Lord Jesus. But he also believed that being justified, if we step out of line, if, if we get off the line of perfection and we step to one side or the other, even to the slightest degree, even for a moment, we lose our justification. And we have to be saved again. We're only justified as long as we live a perfect life. So I may be justified by the grace of God, but I have to keep my justification now by living a perfect life. Now let me ask you, what does that do to the principle of justification? By grace alone, right? The Bible says that if we trust in Jesus, we are justified and if we are justified, we will never lose that justification, but we will actually be glorified. We will reach heaven. Now, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, that very thing. He says, for those whom he, that is God, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, again, if, you, if, if we had time to explore this a little bit further, I want you to notice that whoever comes in at the front makes it all the way to the end. There's no slippage in these categories. Paul doesn't say, some of those whom he foreknew... He predestined. Some of these he predestined, he called. Some of these he called, he justified. Some of these he justified, he glorified. But he says everyone. Everyone who is in one category is picked up and brought into the next category. And I want you to notice that these whom he justified, he also glorified. And that means that if you are just, if you're justified by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will reach glorification. Paul goes on to say in the same chapter that there is nothing in heaven or earth that can possibly stop that from happening, nothing that can sever us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, that even we cannot sever it through our sins. And we wouldn't want to because the Lord has changed our hearts. So again, the point is this, justification that declaration by God that we are righteous does not depend upon what we do. It depends on what Jesus has done, on his perfect righteousness. He's the one who obeyed. He is the one who died so that he might justify all who trust in him. And that really brings us to the last point. If justification is not by works, if justification is by grace alone, if God gives it as a gift purely by his, you know, his sovereign good pleasure, so that he alone receives all the glory, then it has to be something that we receive, not something we work for. It has to be something we receive, and the only way we can receive it is by faith. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 3.27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. And then he writes, as we've already read in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, we've already seen it's not of works. We can't do good works. If we could, we might have something to boast about, but we can, so we have nothing to boast about. God has done it all, so it is his gift. But notice, we've been saved by grace, but it's received by faith. And faith is the opposite of, of, of basically anything we do. Faith is looking away from what we do to what Jesus has done. Now, Paul tells us that this is exactly how Abraham received the righteousness of God. He received it by faith. He writes in verses 3 through 5 of Romans chapter 4, For what does the Scripture say? 
Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Abraham believed. Okay? Again, he didn't believe the facts, but he actually trusted. Now, what is it that Abraham actually believed? Uh, some believe it was just you know, the, the bare promise of God that he was going to bless Abraham, make him the father of many nations, and that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. But it's actually more than that. He believed God's promise that through this seed, through one of his descendants, God would bring blessing to all the nations. He believed in that one that God would actually send his son, the Lord Jesus. So Abraham actually trusted in Jesus. He didn't know his name. He didn't know everything he was going to do. He only knew him as the seed that was going to come from him through whom all the nations would be blessed. But he trusted in that seed. You know, Jesus actually said as much to the Jews in John 8, verse 56. Said to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. That, that's exactly what Paul is talking about here, how Abraham saw Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus through the promise of God, the promise of the Messiah. And he believed and he was glad because he was saved. He was declared just by the one who justifies the ungodly because of the righteousness of Jesus that was given to him by faith. Now again, here's something we have to be careful of because there are some who believe that when Paul says that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, that what he meant was this, that God counted his faith, his act of believing, as an act of righteousness that justifies. In other words, he, he declared that Abraham was just and righteous on the basis of that righteous act that he had just done. He believed God. Now, if that is really what Paul meant, then he's actually undercutting everything he just said. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by anything we do. We are saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus. That's what faith is. Now, as I've said, faith is the opposite of works. I mean, what is saving faith? It's not, again, something I do that God looks at and says, good boy, good man, you did the right thing, and you did a righteous act, and so now you are righteous. That's not what it is, but faith is is essentially doing this. It's looking away from what I've done, entirely away from myself and all my supposed good works. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, everything that I did as a Pharisee, I count as, a, as, a, as really a mountain of dung in order that I might have Jesus. It's looking away from the mountain of dung that we have done, and it's looking to Jesus and trusting in Him and Him alone, receiving His forgiveness and his righteousness that makes us just before God. The Bible says if you are looking to Jesus and to him alone, if you are trusting him and nothing else to save you, then you are just, you are justified, and you will never perish. But if you're not trusting in Jesus alone, if, you're, if maybe you're trusting in Jesus and you want to add something else to it, Maybe your own good works to try to maintain what it is he's given to you or maybe you think that you need those good works or some, some other kind of religious ritual to make you acceptable to God with Jesus. I'll take Jesus and I'll take that circumcision. I'll take Jesus and this baptism. I'll take Jesus and these good works that I do. And I keep adding these things. As long as you add things to it, you, it falls under Paul's condemnation. You've been severed from Christ. You have to trust in Jesus alone. And if you're not trusting Jesus alone, you're not saved. So if you're not trusting Jesus alone, I would encourage you this morning, do that. Trust in Jesus. Jesus offers himself as a savior to you. And he says, if you come to me and trust me alone, 
I will save you. Now let me just remind you in closing this, that even though our works really have nothing to do with our justification, they are not the grounds upon which God declares us to be just. Since it has nothing to do with it, it doesn't mean they're unimportant. We really cannot know that we have been justified, that we have really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ unless we see the evidence of good works in our lives. Good works are important. We're not saying you can live any way you want to and still go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have His Spirit dwelling in you, that Spirit is working in you to make you like Jesus. You will do good works because you have been justified. And if there are no good works... There is no justification. There is no salvation. The Reformers put it in this way. We are justified by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. It will always be accompanied by good works. Sanctification does not bring justification, but sanctification or being made like Jesus will always follow it. And that's what we're going to look at next Lord's Day. But again, I wanted you to have this framework, to have this stuff fresh in your mind, because this evening we're going to be looking at the Roman Catholic view that Luther was reacting against and why it was wrong. And I think it's, clearly, it's clear to see why it's wrong when we look at the Scriptures and we see that works are entirely excluded. So this evening, let's consider what are the works that are being added to justification that actually destroys the gospel. And understanding that, let's reach out to those who are in the Roman church. Let's pray for those in the Roman church that they might see the truth, even as Luther did who was in the Roman church in those days, studying the scriptures, the Lord discovered it to him. Let's pray the Lord will show them his truth through his word that they might come to know him. By the way, one thing that did change in Rome is they do finally provide the Bible in the language of the people. So that's one thing, one good change has taken place, which means they can read and they can see. So let's pray that they will read and that by God's Holy Spirit, he'll lead them to the truth. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to help us examine our hearts as to whether or not we're trusting Jesus and trusting him alone.